um, sure, I just thank you, Steph. It's, it's wonderful. And, you know, in the prayer meeting this morning, we were just talking about living water flowing, you know, through us. And, and I want to pray that really God breaks your heart this morning in places where it needs to be broken so that His Spirit can, can really enter you and you can experience the love and the, the glory and everything that He has for you. So, um, <clears throat> welcome to everybody that's online. Um, I've got the privilege to land this series. <laughs> I don't know how you land the Holy Spirit. Like, I mean... <laughs> Clark, you're the pilot. Come and, <laughs> come and show me how to do this. And if you've been here, it's been so great. And, and I mean, who here this week has had just such enormous, um, saw God working this week? I mean, we were here, just by a raise of hands, to see how the amazing things that God has been doing in our lives. Um, Chalky, we were at Connect, and <laughs> it's the money that was going on. I'm just in awe of what, what God is really doing. So, and I want to really just uh, today... Um, you know, <clears throat> oh, hello everybody online. John, he caught a fish about this big again. Um, so <laughs> he sent us the pictures. Well done, Johnny. Um, so I want to talk about and really bring this thing home today. And, and <clears throat> um, I meet a lot of people and a lot of Christians, especially, you know, Christians that, that, that it almost seems that they're not leading effective Christian lives, um, you know. That they are born again and they love the Lord and everything and stuff, but it's almost as if they're not effective and stuff. And, and I want to share this with you. If that's you today, it's probably because there's just one little flaw in your theology. And I want to bring home today a concept. Well, it's not a concept. It's really the truth about Jesus. And, and if you can solidify this in your hearts this morning, if you can really settle it and, and uh, cement it in your core, I promise you your life will change. Because there are Christians that are still in Egypt. There are Christians that are still in the wilderness, you know. And then there are Christians that's really taking it in the, the, the promised land. And, and, and or, in order for me to do this, I want to talk about the anointing. Something called the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And anointing, we often hear that it's a word that gets thrown around so often, you know. We often hear, wow, that worship was so anointed. And that preacher was so anointed, you know. And I walked into the service and that service was so flippant anointed, you know. And... Um, and it's important for us to, to kind of understand what, what that means and what that means in, 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 in your life. And if we look at the Old Testament, you know, spiritual anointing or anointing was, a, was a, a ritual where there was oil poured onto somebody. A very specific, a very specific fragrance of oil to set him apart for God's purposes. And that's really what holiness means. Holiness means to be set apart from. You are holy. I am holy because we set apart from the rest, okay, in Jesus' kingdom. Um, my experiences with the Holy Spirit, so I grew up in a very staunch Afrikaans kerk, you know. Um, the Holy Spirit was acknowledged, but there was no manifestation of the Holy Spirit. There wasn't speaking in tongues. If you spoke in tongues, you were super weird, and I think you were chased out of the church. And, um, and, and I made the big mistake when I was younger to watch Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Was it the Last Crusade? Do you remember that, where they, where they had the Ark of the Covenant? And then at the end of this, the scene where the Germans, they open up this ark. And then Indiana, he says to this lady, he says, don't look, don't look. You just shouldn't look. And then this, the Holy Spirit kind of comes out of the ark. And then it turns into this monster. And then it just kills and destroys all those Germans. And, and that's the picture I had of the Holy Spirit. So it was scary. And it was, you know, I didn't really, really understand it. And, and <laughs> you know, I thought, please God, I don't want that in my life. <laughs> you know. And so I want to start off by, and, and this is just so, I want to start off with 1 John chapter 2, you know, and, and really if what John is saying to us here is true, and I believe that it is, it is so profound, it's so profound, and it is so terrifying at the same time that uh, you guys need to get this. Okay, so John says, I'm writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. Okay, so the word astray comes from the Greek word planau, and planau is the word where you get the word planet from. And in the primitive world, um, nobody believed that the planets were organized things. They just believed they were these wandering bodies, you know, traveling aimlessly towards nothingness, okay? Who of you have wandered into nothingness before? I have, okay? And so the astray that John was talking about, about 65 AD, that was about 32 years after Jesus died, <coughs> There was a group of people that wanted to revert back to an old system. And that system said that God only rests His anointing, His presence, His dwelling place 
only rests on special certain elite people. That's it. You had to have the right credentials, only very special elite people. Jesus comes along and he insisted that the spirit is on the common man, on me and you. He told the common man, he told Duff, no, you're not common. <laughs> common. <laughs> wie is common nie, so wie is common? You know, I like common people. Das geen voorgee in common nie, ne? Maar, um, so, so, Jesus comes along and he says, you the light of the world, you the salt of the earth, okay? Everybody can have the, um, the spirit of God. And then in the same breath he says, do not think that I came to abolish the Torah, in other words, abolish the scripture, in other words, I actually came to fulfill it. I actually came to fulfill it. So what about that statement that Jesus made would make people think that he was abolishing scripture? scripture. What about that statement? I'm not expecting an answer, okay? <laughs> well, it's actually quite simple because at the time, um, only special people, that was the teaching of the day, could be used by Jesus. Only special people could be um, salt, salt and light. And, and let me tell you, the idea that Jesus rests, the spirit, his, 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 his spirit is upon us, is still an idea that still hasn't taken hold in society. Martin Luther King was the second person after Jesus that really insisted that common people can be used by God as well. And still today, people say, yes, where does God stay? Where's, where does God live? Where does His Spirit stay? In our hearts. We say that, but we don't actually really, really get it. Okay, so John then continues. He says, as for you, the anointing, that, there's that word again, the anointing you receive from Him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has taught you, remain in him. Okay? So, John is not saying that we don't need teachers anymore. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying, listen, teachers, all the teachers die. We've got artificial intelligence now that came to take your job. We've got AI. And uh, you don't need teachers anymore. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, is that you and I don't need to be in the presence of some elite person that was anointed to get from Jesus what we need to get from Jesus. We don't need to be in some special place, Mount Moriah, to serve God. We don't need to be in the temple to worship God. You can do it right here. And, um, and so what John is actually saying, and I'm going to repeat this twice, okay? And this is what you need to just so get into your heart, is that I am not absolved from my responsibility to participate with God and the anointing of the Spirit to heal the world and fix the world just because I see myself as average. I'm not absolved from the responsibility to participate with the Holy Spirit and the anointing of Jesus to fix the world and bring hope and set the captives free and do miracles, you know, and participate with the anointment that God has put on our lives just because I see myself as average. Because let me tell you what a church looks like when a church buys into the planal. John, you the pastor, you do it. That's when a church buys into the planal. How many churches do you know like that? How many of you are sitting here thinking, no, John must do it. Oh, no, 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 no. Tim must do it. Tim is the anointed one. He's the elder. You know? No, Duff, Steph, they must do it. We need a new kids ministry. Oh, no, no, no. Karen, yeah, yeah, you're anointed. You do that. That's what it looks like when a church buys into the planal. And what Jesus said, he said, no, 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 no. Ordinary people, you and I, average people, we can have the Spirit of God. We can be salt and light, okay? It's not just for the special people. And that was part of the revolution of Jesus. That was one of the reasons he was crucified. Because at the time, it was heresy. It was complete heresy for Jesus to come and say something like that. Now, in order for us to be talking about anointing, I'd like just to take us through a, a history of anointing quickly in the bible so the first time we hear about <coughs> anointing when somebody was really anointed was in exodus 28 when um when aaron was anointed and his sons for priesthood okay but before that really um really before moses you know abraham let's just let's just talk about this quickly so so where did god live when abraham was alive and before abraham in noah's days where did god live God lived in the sky somewhere. He was in the sky. That was where he was. Abraham had a revelation, El Shaddai, but El Shaddai lived in the air. 
That was where El Shaddai lived, okay? Who of you have seen that Maui Noah with Russell Crowe? Okay, you know what? Hey, no, man, only you. Really? Okay, some more people have seen Noah, okay? So do you remember when the movie came out, Christians were like, oh, I don't like that movie. That's such a terrible freaking movie. It's not even like biblical, you know? Not biblical. They don't even call him God. They call him great creator, okay? <laughs> a great creator, I love it, <laughs> you know? <clears throat> do you know that the word God was actually derived from the German deity God in the, in the 1400s? Only in the 1400s, people started using the word God. That's not his name. It's a title. That's actually historically correct. Noah would have called him great sky god or great creator or great whatever. The word God only started happening after the 1400s, okay? So God was living in the sky, and then Moses, then what, what does God do? God comes to Moses and says, listen, I want to live amongst the people. I want to get closer to my people. You need to build me a tabernacle, a sanctuary, where I can reside, okay? So Moses goes and he builds a tabernacle, and Jesus goes from the sky, he goes to the tabernacle, and it's a very good move. What is God doing? He's moving from revelation to revelation because he wants to show us what he's doing, okay? And, um, and then from there, Moses then, you know, gets, um, gets the, the opdracht to um, uh, anoint priests, okay? So it goes from the sky, it goes to a sanctuary, then God goes to priests, okay? The priests were anointed, and then you read in Samuel, you know, the prophets were anointed, so you had priests, you had prophets. Samuel, 1 Samuel 16, verse 13, you know, then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. There's the word anoint again. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him, that was David, in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Powerfully upon David. And here's just a little side note quickly. Was David anointed to be a full-time minister? No. Was he anointed to preach? No. He was anointed for battle. He was anointed for strategy. He was anointed for commerce. He was anointed for leadership. That was what he was anointed for. You are anointed in a certain area of your life. Okay? So, <laughs> the anointment of God, all the anointment of God, only rested upon three people, really. All the anointment of God. That's not a lot of people. You know? You've got one king per era, you've got one prophet per era, you've got one priest, you know, and then God kind of stays there somewhere in a tent. And, um, and so, so Jesus comes along, okay, and says that God lives with a Christ. So Jesus comes along. The word um, anointed is really the word creo. It's where we get Christ from. It really means the anointed one, the chosen one. The Spirit of God is upon the chosen one. And Jesus, you know, it's so beautiful. Luke chapter 4, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me. To do what? To proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of the sight for the blind. To set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. In Isaiah 61, it says again, the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Just so, by the way, if you don't know what your purpose is in God, this is your purpose. Just, by the way. If you don't know, oh, I don't know what my purpose is and stuff, just go back to Isaiah 61, okay? And um, so, God goes from the sky to a sanctuary, to people, and then with Christ, Okay? And then the last thing in John 22, he starts talking about us. Jesus says, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them. Receive the Holy Spirit. It's better that I leave so that the Holy Spirit can come to you. Now, it's so incredible. You know, in the beginning of creation, you see God breathing on <laughs> dirt. And breath and the word spire is exactly the same word. So, in the ancient world, world you know, they, they spoke about being inspired and expired. So God breathed the inspired dirt. We are inspired dirt. That's what we are, okay? You and I, that's exactly what we are. With God's breath and spirit, He breathed upon us. In the ancient world, when people said when somebody died, He said, no, He didn't die, He expired. You know, like expired food in your fridge, okay? And here again, God is coming full circle. Why? Because Adam and Eve sinned. The spirit, kind of God's spirit, couldn't be synonymous with the sin. And God's spirit was never in them. You know, that God's spirit was only with them. 
And the Old Testament, God's Spirit came, only came upon people. You must remember this. And so God's Spirit kind of removed themselves from Adam and Eve because he used to walk with them in the cool of the day, every single day. God's Spirit removed himself, but God wanted to find a way back to have relationship with us. Okay? There's a reason why Jesus didn't come directly after Eve took the bite of the apple. That is a whole completely different sermon. But so, so Jesus, again, full circle, breathes. God is breathing again on dirt, inspired dirt, and say, receive the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is promising the Holy Spirit to a massive group, massive, large group of people, large group of people, okay? And at the time, that was just absolutely unthinkable, unthinkable. Why would a holy God and uh, uh, an almighty Father, God of heaven and earth, Alpha and Omega, why would he come and make his life inside of a broken, sinful, crazy human being? It's just, you know, Christianity is the only religion that actually believes that God comes and lives inside of us. All the other religions, we have to kind of do whatever we need to do to please this God, you know, whatever it is that we're serving, okay? And that was called, that was just called heresy. So, the question is this, okay, so we received the Holy Spirit. The, the, the Holy Spirit was received at Pentecost, but so we receive it. Um, if we receive the Holy Spirit, then what is it that He's doing inside of us? There's two things I want to I want to share with you. Number one, John 14, 25 is the Spirit will teach us and remind us. At the time when Jesus was alive, there wasn't MP3s and YouTube and a Bible app that you could just quickly go to. You know, everybody here probably has still a, a real Bible, right? Do you know that having a Bible is only a hundred years old phenomenon? Less than a hundred years? Prior to that, there were these family Bibles. Do you remember the family Bible? It was so massive, them, full of dust. People didn't have the Bible. So, so what Jesus is saying is, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit so that I can remind you and teach you of what I said. That's what the Holy Spirit does. It reminds you and brings to your mind what Jesus is up to and keeps you in line. Okay, that's part of the Holy Spirit's job. Number two, the Spirit, okay, I wrote this down. The Spirit convinces us to agree that we are sinful, that Christ is enough despite our failures, and that there is hope for where the world is going. The Spirit convinces us to agree that we are sinful, that Christ is enough despite our failures, and that there is hope for where the world is going. Okay, here's how Jesus said it. He said, when He comes, which is the Holy Spirit, He will prove to the world the current order of things, okay, to be in the wrong about sin. Righteousness and judgment. About sin because people do not believe in me, but he convicts righteous people that they are righteous. So evidently here is what happens. If you're not in Christ, he's not talking about he wants to convict people that are in Christ about sin. That's not what he's talking about. He wants to convince, because convict and convince here is exactly the same word. He wants to convince people that are not in Jesus that they are sinful. Because when people admit it, and they agree with and they repent, God's faithfulness will take them the rest of the way. Then he says, but what the Spirit also does is it convinces us of our righteousness. If you are sitting here today and you are in Jesus Christ, and you feel that the Holy Spirit is convicting you of sin, convicting you of sin, convicting you of sin, that's likely not the Holy Spirit. That's more likely the butcher. It's not the shepherd. Because God's Holy Spirit, what he does is convinces you of what you are, not of what you are not. God's Holy Spirit is there to constantly remind you and teach you that you are righteous, that you are loved, that you're seated in heavenly places, that you are justified, just as if you have sinned, that, I've, that you have, have, have got world-changing potential, that I've cleaned you, that you're my son, that you're the head and not the tail, that there's an open door before you that nobody else can shut, that you are the anointed one. You have got the creo inside of you. You have got the spirit of Jesus, the same spirit of Jesus inside of you. And when God looks at you, He doesn't look at your soul part. He doesn't look at Duff. He looks at the Spirit. He sees Jesus inside of Duff. That's what He does. He sees Jesus inside of Wilfred. If you're a brand new Christian and nothing has changed, you know, if you had cancer last night and you became a Christian, you're probably going to have cancer today. If you were, um, if you were broke last night, you were probably going to be broke today again when you're a Christian. Okay? But the moment that happens and you've got a rebirth, Jesus suddenly looks at that, and you clean, and you wash clean. Um, so, just to summarize this quickly, okay? 
Where does God live? God lives in temples and in the sky and on people and on priests and on prophets and everybody. Okay? And what is the Holy Spirit doing? He's affirming and he's correcting and he is reminding us and he's keeping us in line with what Jesus is doing and he's reminding us that there's hope for this world. And then Jesus comes and he makes the most craziest statement in the world. Okay? Just this crazy statement. He says this. Very truly I tell you that whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing and they will do even greater things than me because I'm going to the Father. I mean, here's the Son of God, Jesus Christ. I mean, it's God himself in the flesh coming down and he says, You, Cindy. <laughs> he says, You will do greater things than even me. Okay? And um, so the question is how? What did he mean by that? Cindy, give me my phone on. Okay. I want to ex- just illustrate this to you quickly. Okay. So... Jesus didn't mean you're also going to walk on water and you'll be able to fly. That's not what he meant when he said you're going to do greater things than I. Okay? That's not what he meant. So this thing changed absolutely everything in the world. Everything. When I was a little kid, my mom and dad used to watch the news at, I think, I can't remember, it was like 6 or 7 o'clock and stuff, and we weren't allowed, allowed to say a single word at all, because if they didn't watch, finish watching the news, they wouldn't know what was going on in the world. Then they would have to buy the build or whatever the next day, and it was just too long for them to wait, but they would watch the news, then 7 o'clock it was MacGyver, or A-Team, or whatever, or Airwolf, okay, that, that we could watch. So, so they would be watching the news, and why, why was it like that? Because there was only one entity in South Africa, only three in America, that had broadcasting power. Only three. If you missed it, you missed it, okay? So what is Jesus doing? And, and, and this was the fear of the first century, okay? So, the fear of the first century was that if we give the Holy Spirit to everybody, okay, the priests are going to lose their jobs. Think about it. The priests are going to lose their jobs. Okay. Are there more news channels today than ever before? Has the news become more popular than ever before? Ever before? Yeah, why? Nobody, you don't stress if you don't watch the 7 o'clock news. You don't stress because you already know what the news is. You had it up your Facebook, you had it up your Twitter, you watched everything and stuff. Do you know that the news cycle today is 17 seconds? The entire new cycle across the world. You just post something and, you know, kind of there, there, there it happens. So, Jesus comes and he says, listen, mate, okay, I'm going to give you a cell phone. Because with a cell phone, everybody's got broadcasting power. Everybody's got a camera. Everybody's going to make things. I'm, I'm, he says, I'm going to give you the power. And you're going to be the salt. And you're going to be the light. And you're going to be living water that's going to change the world. And that's how we're going to do greater things. I have to go. He didn't go to them and say, oh, I'm going to have to go to the Father and send you the Holy Spirit. That's not what he did. He said, I have to go, because if I don't go, I can't send you the Spirit. How many pastors are there today? How many Christians are there today? It has just absolutely exploded. Okay. Shall I meet my? So I just want to leave you with a few questions about the Holy Spirit for us to wrestle with, because there's no point we really talk about this stuff if you don't wrestle with this and get closer to Jesus. There's no point. Okay. What would happen if Christians really believed it? What would happen if you truly, truly believe it? Because it's, it's, it's a fight that people don't believe it. You know, people come to church and they absolve themselves from their responsibility to participate with the Spirit, okay? And they just leave everything for the elite people again. That's what happens in most churches. Most churches, okay? Number two, are you going to put yourself in opposition to what the Spirit is doing in your life or are you going to participate? It's very simple. I spoke to John during this week about, I just wanted to get a few facts, and you know, he said, you know, two people can stand and two people can be anointed with the same oil. One person can decide, well, okay, great, I'm anointed, I'm going out. Another person can say, listen, I'm going to participate. I want to get everything from this anointing. I want to work with the Spirit. I want to search. I want to, I want to, I want to get as much from this as possible. The choice is up to you. We're all anointed. We all have the exact same amount of power inside of us. Then John, then the rabbi, then the priest, all of us, exactly the same. When the Holy Spirit comes inside of you, He doesn't fill you up halfway, He fills you up to the max. You are filled. It's not half filled, and then you are filled. You decide, am I going to trust it and, and move into it? And I want to freaking get everything from the Holy Spirit that I can, or I'm just going to oppose it? Your choice. What is the difference between being in the presence of God and the presence of God being in us? What is the difference? Okay, so I went and watched the show the other day, We Will Rock You. A friend of mine is playing uh, in it. It's a musical. It's at the Teatro. And it's a Queen show. And they sing all these Queen songs. And I promise you, they did it so well. If I closed my eyes, I was in the presence of Freddie Mercury while he's dead. Um, well, I mean, 
Who's your favorite singer that's still alive? You can just put on a song and you can be in the presence of flippin' Iron Maiden. Don't listen to Iron Maiden. Um, <laughs> you can be in the presence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so you can be in the presence of your favorite speaker, present of your favorite teacher like that, okay? But how much of the presence of Freddie Mercury is inside of me? Very little. If I have to try and sing like him, it'll just be absolutely crazy. So the difference is, is, is that to what degree, because yes, yes, number four, this is what I want to talk about. What does it look like if we all have access to the anointing that some people seem to live and project a more of an anointing than other people? Why? Well, because there's a big difference between me being in the presence of God and the presence of God being in me. Because everybody can be in the presence of God just like that. Every, everybody. To what degree am I going <clears> to <throat> move with the Holy Spirit within me so that my soul, the renewal of the mind, so that everything can be filled by the Spirit. That's up to you. Some people say that person is more anointed than other people because he's just walking like that. With well, do you know what it takes? It takes discipline. It takes prayer. It takes reading the Word of God. It takes settling it in our soul. It takes coming to, to church, fellowshipping, loving, taking risks, <clears throat> having faith in Jesus, spending time in the Word. That's what it takes to really, really soak yourself with what God has got for us. So, you know, it's, it's, it's so funny. I, I, um, when, when I went through a very bad patch about five, well, six, seven years ago, and I remember I was at this cross, and I bowed onto this cross, and I said, God, please, Jesus, just do something. And he said, okay, I've already done everything. You do something. <laughs> what more must I do? <laughs> what more must I do? I have killed my son. I have given you the Holy Spirit. I have, what more must I do? Sure. It was a wake-up call for me. Because you have everything for goodness and life and glory and godliness inside of you. You have world-changing potential inside of you. You can go out and you can change the world. You don't have to just change Olive Dale. You can if you want. But, you know, so... In conclusion, are we doing greater things than he? And if not, why not? Like, ask yourself that question. Are you doing greater things than Jesus? And if not, why not? And, and so, <clears throat> I pray that you, that, you, that you understand your righteousness in Jesus. I pray that you'll submit your life to the risen Christ. Done. I pray that you will not be opposing the infinite possibilities that, that God has placed inside of you. I pray that you, that you don't just let the living water just kind of, you kind of just go through your day. We spoke about it in prayer, you know, that, you, that sometimes you're in the Spirit and sometimes you're not in the Spirit. And sometimes you're in the Spirit and you're not in the Spirit. Because you can do. That's what Jesus said. Do greater things than what He has ever done. That you are anointed. You are the salt and the light of this world and this earth that's going to change this world. You are, and I am. We are the hope for this country and for this world. Not some elite person, not the pastor, not the leaders of political parties, not some dude out there. You and I are, and it's time that we, we, we rise up. We rise up and we take in that place. Thank you, Steve, you can come up. I just want to say, um, keep our country in your prayers for tomorrow. We've got no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. No idea, you know. God knows. God is in control. He's really in control. But pray for our country. Pray for our leaders. Don't get angry at them. <laughs> yes, I flip. Come here. Just pray for them, you know. God is in control. The world is getting better. It's not getting worse. South Africa is getting better. People think it's getting worse. It's not. It's getting better. Why? Because Jesus' hand is coming into this broken picture. Because Jesus came to better the world and give hope. Not to judge it and destroy it. But get out of that mindset that everything's getting worse. It's not getting worse. Do you want a laparoscopy today or 100 years ago? You know this. <laughs> I mean, just, just come on. Just, just do a bit of history. Just, just, you know, read a little bit more and you'll realize that this world is coming flipping. It's... You know, you, don't, you want to go to a dentist today, not a hundred years ago. 
Keep it. Life expectancy. I mean, okay, I'm not even going to go down that rabbit hole. Thank you for praying not to go down the rabbit hole. But, but guys, come on. We serve a great, awesome Father. Go out and let's shine the light and be the salt of this earth. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us. You might be asking yourself the question, how can I take this further? Firstly, you can send us your contact details to cindy at centerchurch.co.za where we can include you in our online connect groups and you can receive our daily devotional. Secondly, you can hop on our website where you can access previous sermons and find out more about who we are at Center Church. Thirdly, if you consider yourself as part of Center Church, we want to thank you so much for your ongoing financial partnership. The banking details are on the website. Thank you so much for joining us and hope you have an amazing day.